Sales Conf. How's everybody doing? Yeah. I figured we'd try something crazy and start on time. Sound good? So those of you that have seen me give talks before can probably guess what's about to happen. Uh, my name is Ben Ornstein. I work at ThoughtBot, and I would love it if you would all stand up, please. Oh, man, this is hard to see. Okay, check this out. I'll take the stage. Uh, would you please all uh, do a set of 12 air squats with me? Get the blood pumping a little bit. Do you know what an air squat is? You just squat down and stand back up. We'll do 12 together. Ready? One, two, three. Come on, feel the burn. There's 10, 12. Awesome. Now, would you please reach your hands up in the air like you don't even care? And get a good stretch on. Really stretch them. Get a little taller. Now, would you keep your abs tight and would you blend this way? Let's get a nice stretch that way. Keep those abs tight. Now give me 10% more. Oh, yeah. Abs tight. Let's come back up to the middle. And now we're going to go that way. Same thing. Here we go. Feel that stretch. Don't make the pain face. Don't go in your pain cave. There's, there's no power animal in there. One more. 10%. Don't make the pain face. And up. Excellent. Now would you please turn to your neighbor and thank him for coming. Say, hey, neighbor, how's it going? Shake their hands. Awesome, go ahead and take your seats. Whew. So this talk is how to talk to developers. Um, again, if you know me, you would know that I, I, there's no way I could just give a pure meta talk. I'm a very practical guy. Um, I like to focus on examples and real world things. Uh, there's no way I could just sit here and talk to you for 40 minutes purely about giving talks. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to give you several lightning talks that'll work with your short attention spans <laughs> or towards the end of the week. And so I'm going to give these, these lightning talks, and then I will talk about the techniques I use in the lightning talk and mix in a little meta talk as we go. So worst case scenario, if you learn nothing about speaking, you'll hopefully at least learn something from the lightning talks. Uh, best case scenario, you might learn a little bit more than that. So the first thing I want to talk about is law of Demeter. So can I have Chad Pytel? Joe Ferris, Kayla Thompson, John Yurick, and George Brockerhurst. To the stage, please. And would you stand over here, gentlemen? These are all thought plotters. These are my colleagues. Say hi, colleagues. Hi, colleagues. <laughs> that was them to you, actually. But thanks for your participation. OK, so can I have you in that order? Can we have Chad, and then Joe, and then Caleb, and then John? And George, will you come over here, please? I'm going to hold you in reserve. You're my special guy. <laughs> OK, so law of Demeter. The most important thing to know about law of Demeter is that everyone will argue about how to pronounce it. Some people say Demeter, some people say Demeter. I'm going to switch between the two to troll you maximally. <laughs> OK, um, can stand a little further so I can see your pretty faces highlighted in my nice white projector screen. A little further, there we go. OK, so these gentlemen, these good looking gentlemen, are objects in my system. I have built a system. Chad is an object, Joe is an object, Caleb is, is an object, and John is the object. Now, John is the master of the time. John knows what time it is. Do you know what time it is? Uh, 10.30. Perfect, John knows what time it is. OK. So I have built this system, and these components are wired together. These components, yes. And <laughs> the best thing about having the mic is being able to troll your colleagues. Um, so Chad has now wants to know what time it is. However, because I'm not aware, or I was, I was not aware of what the law of Demeter is, or Demeter, as it's often known, uh, I have encoded the information of how to look up what time it is. And so what Chad knows is that he should ask Joe to ask Caleb to ask John what time it is. Chad knows that exact chain of how to get that information. So now Chad wants to find out what time it is, so Chad says, hey, Joe, please ask Caleb to ask John what time it is. Hey, Joe, please ask Caleb to ask John what time it is. And then Joe knows what to do. He asks Caleb to ask John. And then Caleb asks John. And John, what time is it? 10.30. And the, this information, 10.30-ish. This information, <laughs> I didn't code John very well. <laughs> I monkey patched time.now to be time.now-ish. <laughs> Not as good. Um, so this information of the ish flows back to Chad, and Chad finds out what time it is. And that is great. However, I'm about to break Chad. So what I'm going to do is say, thank you very much, Caleb, for your help. You may go sit down. And George, come in. Caleb, I'm sorry, but you've been refactored. <laughs> <laughs> this is George. George is my new replacement for Caleb. He's, he functions better than Caleb did. I'm sorry, Caleb. <laughs> so, but the problem is, I've broken Chad. 
So Chad now asks Joe to ask Caleb to ask John what time it is. And Joe says, no problem. I'm going to ask, uh-oh. And then we have an exception. And Chad has an exception inside him, and it makes him sad. <laughs> Chad is broken. And the problem is, the reason he's broken is because of the structural duplication in the system. That's what Law of Demeter is all about. It's about avoiding structural duplication. It says, don't encode in your objects knowledge about how the whole system is wired together. So, what we need to do to fix this, since we have to refactor anyway because we broke Chad and we have to bust Chad open and rip apart his internals, sorry Chad, um, we're going to change him while we're here. And what we're going to do instead is have Joe turn towards Chad and block his vision. And now, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Now, when Chad would like to ask what time it is, he may ask Joe, but Joe isn't going to let him know what he's doing, right? So Chad says, hey, Joe, what time is it? Hey, Joe, what time is it? And Chad has no idea what Joe's going to do. He's going to block him off. He's going to turn around, and he's going to be like, hey, George, what time is it? And then George has also blocked Joe. Joe doesn't know what's going on behind George. George whispers in John's ear. It's still 10.30-ish, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible programmer, as that's me. And the information flows back, but now, Later, if I want to swap out George again, or even John again, it doesn't bother Chad. Chad is not broken. So let's have one big clap all at the same time for these guys. Wait, 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 wait. One big clap all at the same time for these guys. Much better, thank you guys. They just get one clap. So that's law of Demeter. Don't encode structural knowledge about your system in your objects, because then you have coupling. Chad knew exactly how to get the time. All I want Chad to know is who he should ask to get the time. And that person should block off how that person is getting the time. And that way you can swap out components. It reduces coupling. That's what Law of Demeter is all about. OK, so that's it. That was the first lightning talk. Lightning talk over. We're five minutes in. Let's talk about a little meta stuff. So what you probably notice is that right off the bat, I did two things that you probably have not seen in this conference. We started off with some light calisthenics. That's just to get your blood flowing, to get you excited, to get you paying attention. And also, we did some sort of live demonstration with people and pushing and tugging and all that. Now, that's very intentional. Talks have to reach out and grab people. You've got to do it right away. Because your first 30 seconds or so, your first 60 seconds or so, you are setting the tone. Also, notice how my introduction went. My introduction is one sentence. It says, my name is Ben Orenstein. I work at ThoughtBot, and I would like you all to stand up. So before the end of my first introductory sentence, something weird has already happened. And that is completely intentional. Uh, for, I want from the start for you to be like, what? What is this guy doing? That's how you keep people's attention. Throw something weird at them. Make something odd happen. Most people, when they give talks, they like to come up, and they have a slide. And the slide is about themselves. And they have a second slide, and the slide is about their company. And they think they should you know, thank the company for sending them and tell you what their company does. And then they try to tell you, they summarize the talk. And they try to sell you on why this is an important problem. And then they give you some background information about this problem. And then they give you your first example. And what happens is you find that at about minute 10, the most important thing has been, or one important thing has been taught to you. But before that, it was almost all noise. And so I try to hit people with my thesis right away. And here's the thesis for this talk. This talk. It is more important to be entertaining than informative. Bored people do not learn anything. It doesn't matter how good your information is if it's not interesting to watch. If you can't hold people's attention, they don't learn a thing. Now, that's not to say that you should only be entertaining and have no substance to your talk. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying there's a hierarchy. You have to start with the interesting part. You have to hold people. And that's hard to do because you're fighting the whole internet. People have laptops. You have to be more interesting than the internet. <laughs> I recommend air squats. OK. So uh, I have a quick story, which was I was at a conference. And this is a conference we put on for college students in Boston. And we're teaching them very basic stuff about software engineering. And uh, there was a talk done by Nick Caranto. Hey, Nick. Good timing. That's Nick over there. And so Nick gave a talk about the basics of TDD. Now, at that point, I had been doing TDD professionally for about a year and a half. And this was intentionally, a, this was an eight-minute introductory talk, very simple, very straightforward. I literally learned nothing during the talk. I knew everything that Nick said during the talk. But I was completely engrossed for the whole thing because of his delivery. The way he presented the information made me enjoy the talk, even though I didn't learn anything. Sandy Metz has a saying that she passed down to her, which is, people enjoy the story they don't know. Or sorry, people love the story they know. Even if you know the story, even if you know the information, if you can present it well in a compelling way, people will pay attention. 
Okay, one, one more thought of how you build a talk. When a reporter creates a piece for a newspaper, they write in a very specific way. And you'll notice this, like, check this out when you go to like New York Times from now on. The very first sentence is an extremely high level summary of what happened. The next paragraph is more detail, still high level about what happened. Each paragraph builds on the previous one. The dependencies of the paragraph all point upward. You'll never have a paragraph here that refers to something that's gonna be just explained down here. All the dependencies point this way, and that's so that their editor can cut the piece at any point and still have a complete article. Because sometimes you only want this much, and sometimes you have a lot of column inches, and so you want this much. Write your talks that way. I've already told you my most important thesis. We're not even 10 minutes in. If you guys went to sleep right now, you would know the most important thing I think I have to tell you, which is it's more important to be interesting than informative. And so if you all tune out, that's okay. I got my best point at you. I think there's more good stuff in here, so let's see what else we can come up with. So a lot of people have probably heard of tell, don't ask with object-oriented programming. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. If you haven't heard of it, you should Google it later. It's an interesting idea. Uh, something I follow for talks is show, don't tell. So let's see what that looks like. So I wanna show you three interesting things that have improved my Vim productivity recently. Anybody here a fan of Vim? Anybody heard of Vim? Yeah? Come on, Vim! There we go. Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. This is Vim in inverted colors. They're a little ugly. That's okay. So first thing that I have learned, I picked up from Mr. Joe Ferris, he convinced me while we were pairing, is something called relative number. So notice the line numbers on the left side of the screen and what happens is I move my cursor. Everything is relative to my cursor. My cursor is always on line zero. Why is that good, you ask? What an excellent question. What an attractive audience. Um, <laughs> so that's good because you don't have to eyeball things anymore. So let's say I wanna go up to the start of the method find by off hash, which is four lines up. I can say 4K and jump right there. I don't have to hold K or hold J. By the way, holding characters in Vim is a nice anti-pattern to be aware of. So I can do quick vertical motion. Let's say I wanna delete this whole method, because you know what, this method's just kinda garbagey. So I wanna delete the whole method plus the line below it. I can say 4DD. I don't have to estimate how long that method is, because I can see, oh, it goes from zero to three, or three is on the white space, and I wanna get rid of the white space as well, that's four lines. Bam, I can delete that whole thing at once. As opposed to visual mode, right? Visual mode, start selecting, come down here, go down here, blah, 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 who has time for that? I'm a consultant, I get paid by the hour. If anybody saw me do that, if clients saw me using visual mode, I'd be so embarrassed. <laughs> also useful for things like indenting. So let's come down here. This right here, I think I just noticed this morning, this doesn't need to be a begin. We, we have like a, an implicit uh, thing wrapped around this part right here to rescue this. So let's get rid of this begin. So now I need to unindent this whole thing all the way down to the line that is uh, nine lines below. So I can say nine, less than, less than, to dedent all that stuff. Actually, let, and let's decide we don't wanna uh, rescue this anymore, so nine J hop down there, and then I want to delete all the way to the end, so I'll say 7DD. It's just fast. Joe has an awesome analogy that he used with it. It's, he says, it's like you're driving a car, and 50 feet up ahead of you, you see a turn that you want to take. You want to take a left, and with relative number, you just take the left, and you're there. And I love that, because that's how it feels. It's just so fast. So that's relative number, that's the first thing. Oh, oh and there's another cool thing I learned last night. Um, say I want to move down, I'm gonna change the thing, last name, which is currently six lines, or seven lines below me, I wanna change that variable name. Um, if I just say 7J, or uh, uh, 6J, I'll move down to last name. Uh, what I wanna do instead is move to the L. You can actually use plus. Plus says move down to the next line to the first non-white space character, which is pretty badass. So here's just plus alone. See how it hops down there? Here's, here's minus. Of course it does the opposite. So I can say, go down to last name, I'll say six plus. Oops, I overshot. Five plus. You get the gist. <laughs> Zero base arithmetic is difficult for me. All right, Ruby. By the way, you can still have absolute numbers. So one of the, the, one of the downsides of this is, it's a little annoying when you're pairing, because like, oh, just change that thing in line four, two, three, duh. There. <laughs> so that's a little annoying. It's easy to flip between these two things. Um, but you can still get your numbers. Like if you notice in the bottom right, I have a line number in my status line. You can see it counting up and down. You can also still jump to specific numbers. Like your test says, oh, you, you, got, you got a problem on line 32. You type 32 capital G and you pop right there. So it's not too big a deal. There's workarounds for that. Uh, two more things. 
that I learned that were very handy. The first is a new leader command. I love leader commands. I have so many leader commands. Here are my leader commands, some of them. Um, by the way, I think this is one of the best ways to improve your speed with Vim is to define a ton of leader commands whenever you're repeating stuff. So this one that I want you to look at is right here. So I was watching a play-by-play -play with um, uh, Aaron Patterson and Corey Haynes, and they get something done and the tests pass, and Aaron goes, oh my God, please commit. And I understand that mentality. Like sometimes you're like, it works, please just get it in there, make it, let's, let's write this down. So this just adds the current directory, commits it with a message of work in progress, WIP, and pushes it up. Because you know, why not push it, sounds great. I think a good mentality to get into is try not to leave the editor. Don't make committing code a leave the editor activity. Don't make running tests a leave the editor activity. Stay in Vim. So that's number two. Here number three is, this is something I want you to do on the plane ride home. So you're gonna be sitting there and you have no internet, and that's a bummer. You got no Wi-Fi most likely. So type colon H and go to the help and then scroll way down here. Don't hold J though like I'm doing. And check out this section, editing effectively. Maybe you could read some of these docs and not learn anything, but I'd be pretty surprised. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Vim actually has really good documentation, especially for an open source tool. <laughs> so go ahead and check that out on your plane ride. Learn, pick up a couple things. Don't try to cram 10 things in your brain, but pick up one or two. Okay, so zoom back up to meta mode for a second. So I did some show, don't tell. I'm a huge fan of live coding live demos, showing things for real in a real editor or in a real browser. I think it's so powerful. Because of, I guess because of PowerPoint, because of history, because of precedent, people think I have to give a talk, therefore I will write some slides. I think slides can be awesome in certain instances. Sometimes the right visual aid in a slide is tremendous, but I think as our default means for conveying information, it kind of stinks. Slides are dead. They're objects under glass. So slides to me are like photos. Live demos are like videos. You're showing a sequence of what happens live. There's more information being conveyed in it. So imagine you're trying to teach someone how to throw a Frisbee and so you show him a, a series of five different things of you throwing the Frisbee versus this is how you throw a Frisbee. There's so much more information conveyed in the live action of doing it. So I try not to reach for slides almost ever. I think, it's, I think it tends to create more compelling talks. And that gets back to the being interesting thing again. Live coding, I think is more interesting than code on a slide. It takes more work, it's pretty tough. People say, I don't know how you do it. It's not that bad, it's not that hard. It's just kind of hard. But giving talks is kind of hard. And your challenge is to be interesting. So try to do that. I think live coding is an awesome way to be more interesting. Okay, that's my rant on live stuff. So let's do a quick uh, sidebar on body language. This is something that a lot of new speakers struggle with. So quick body language check. What's good body language? Well, kind of tall. Nice tall posture, looking comfortable, confident. The thing that most people struggle with is their hands. So there's a lot of temptation, an extremely natural reaction to the intensity of having this many people look at you is to do this. That's not so good. Even worse is this. This, one's e this one happens a lot. This is kind of hard to see. I'm up here. Even worse is this, or this. This is pretty bad too, whoa. <laughs> for various reasons, don't stand on chairs. This is the worst of all, by the way. Like, look how I look to you guys right now. Think about how your perception of me changes versus this. This is the best default posture for talking. Hands, or arms bent right about here, very neutral, very fine, you can't get in trouble with this. I think one hand in a pocket is all right. Casual kind of talk, we're just talking. We're talking code. <laughs> we're hanging out. You wanna switch sides? Whatever. That's cool. Two hands? Mm, this is starting to look a little bit like this. I think two hands is a little too cash, a little too much, a little too closed off. So when in doubt, go with this. Arms bent at 90 degrees, maybe drop one, maybe one pocket if you're feeling pretty saucy. <clears throat> okay. Uh, where did we go? There we go. Okay. So let's take a change of pace. New lightning talk. This is a story. So this is a story about my very first programming job ever. So I had no experience, so I took an entry level position at a company uh, that would hire me and train me. I had written some code on my own, but I had never done it professionally. So they hired me and I was so excited. And then, after not very long, I discovered that this company had the worst case of not invented here syndrome that you have ever experienced in your whole life. So this is a 30 year old medical software company and when they got started in the game, mainframes were being used in hospitals. So what you had to do is you had to write your own operating system. And then you had to write your own programming language, 
and then you ran that on the mainframe, and that was how you delivered software. And so the DNA of this company encoded that information in a law of Demeter violation. <laughs> and today, or and, you know, when I got there in 2006 or so, they were still writing their own mail client, to-do list application, text editor, and programming languages. And, and also operating system that ran emulated on Windows. Which <laughs> Awesome. So in the early 90s, HP approached this company and said, we want to do bedside ordering for doctors. We want to give them a handheld device, which probably would have been like this big at the time, and we want them to be able to do like order things for their patients without going to a computer. Only we have about 500K of RAM to work with. So this company that I was working for said, well, not a problem. What we can do is we can design a language that's extremely small. And by small, I mean literally it has a very low number of characters per program. <laughs> I swear I'm not making this up. <laughs> so let, here, are the, here are the details of this programming language. Locals in this programming language are capital letters. So if you want a local variable, you cannot name it patient or doctor or order or account. You would name them P or O or D or A. You have A through Z within a method. Those are all you can use for local variables. You cannot give a more descriptive name, sorry. Next, you have globals, which are a letter plus a number, lowercase a through z plus numbers. That's where you store your data if you want some global data, which of course you want lots of global data. <laughs> Next, built-in functions for the programming language are two, are pairs of letters. So lowercase z, capital T, means print this on the screen, obviously. Capital V, lowercase r, means, I don't know, kill the patient. <laughs> uh, there was a thing you would use as you were programming this. You'd flip up and like, look through and, and find the code for the function you wanted to call, because they weren't even mnemonic. They were just, you had to memorize what they were. So those are your functions, built in. To define your own functions, which you could do, which is frankly very generous of them, uh, you could use single numbers. So within a file, you would say, call function six on the piece of data F. And then when that comes back, store it in R. <laughs> and pass it to function ZM. Yeah, you're getting a picture. They had uh, one data structure, which was a list. They had one conditional, which is if. They had one looping construct, which is do. And very strict rules about line breaks. So it's very hard to actually break a line. The rules for when you could break a line were uh, pretty draconian, and so sometimes you had to really stretch a long line of statements out before you could break it. Now, fortunately, I had the good sense to quit this company eventually, um, and I had the good sense to take a screenshot before I left because I knew no one would believe me. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you some proprietary information that hopefully won't get me sued. Uh, this is the for real programming language. So first, I just want you to get a sense of it. Uh, this is better, right? Okay. So I just, I know you can't read it, but this is, check out the shape of it. So remember I told you about the line breaks not being easy to do? I'll, and so, by the way, this is gonna be hard to see, but do you see the scroll bar edge right here? <laughs> All the way, it's like three times this wide. So let's zoom in. This is a macro view, I think you have an, an idea. Let's, let's zoom in and check this out a little bit closer. Uh, let's check it out up here. And you're gonna see I was not lying to you. <laughs> Why are you applauding? <laughs> this is, yeah, because I survived, good answer. Mm. Um, so let's talk about what's happening on line one here. <laughs> I mean, I, I know it's obvious. So this says if, you access the global data that's in lowercase v1, which, and this, this at sign is how you access things. This means like, you know, it's like double parens in uh, JavaScript. So if you access something from uh, the data structure v1, and then you feed it into the function capital C, capital V, which does, obviously, you know what it does, um, <laughs> and that equals one, then let's start building a data structure. We'll build a list of whatever was in v1, but grab the zeroth piece of it, feed in whatever is in our local O, which is, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> o probably stands for order, would be my guess in this one. Um, and then the, the literal four. 
obviously. <laughs> and then take that structure, feed it to the HE built-in, and store the result back in O. We are now one line into the file. You guys, you're with me, right? You're totally, you're following me? You're starting to get a picture. Let's scroll down to the main body of this program, this do loop right here. So I don't remember what almost any of this does. However, I do remember that LK, at LK reads from the keyboard. Um, so I believe this is, this is like the main like input loop. And so we have like at LK equals 13. Like if that's, is that enter in ASCII? Anybody remember? Yeah. So if, if the user hits enter, you know, do this conditional, which is like build a data structure of OJ and R, obviously, and feed it into at, at five right there. That's one of my local methods. That's one of my local functions. So build a data structure of OJ and R and um, run it through number <laughs> code set five and then assign that to EOJR and grab the zeroth piece. And if that's true, then, well, just kind of kill yourself. <laughs> so in conclusion, if you were ever wondering why my Ruby code looks so bad, it's because this is my first language. So, <laughs> so sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so uh, back to Meta Land. Uh, people like stories. People especially like stories if they're about you and they're embarrassing. And programmers especially like stories if they're about code that you wrote that's worse than their code. <laughs> so feel free to use that. This is why the daily WTF is so popular. People love this stuff. It's a little bit like crack. Even if it gives me PTSD to show it to you and exposes me to lawsuits. Um, I want to take a quick second. So uh, at ThoughtBot, we recently rolled out a new thing that I want to tell you about. It's called Learn Prime. So we have all these workshops, we have all these screencasts, we have all, all these eBooks, and they're all pretty awesome. But they're all uh, the workshops in particular, are like a thousand bucks, not approachable to everybody. So what we did is we packaged everything up, we put it in this new thing called Learn Prime. There's a monthly subscription for it. It's kind of awesome. I think it's a pretty good deal. The site, whoops, looks like that. It's learn.thoughtbot.com. And we have a discount code for you. It's RailsConf, all capital. It gets you 20% 20, 20 off your first month. So keep that in mind. OK, so jump up to Meta for a couple seconds. I want to talk about dealing with nerves, dealing with nervousness. Huge issue for speakers, very common. So the first thing to do is to accept its inevitability. I still get nervous before every talk. I've done a bunch of them now. It's still, it's just agitating. It's hard. It's scary. It's really tough. So you're just going to get nerves. And so the first thing is to realize it's going to happen and to take it as an expected and normal result of what you're about to do, which is about to stand in front of a bunch of your peers and tell them things. So what I do is I start my talks with calisthenics. And partly, that's like 80% to get you guys going and to wake you up and see what's going on. But it's also partly for me. Because when I walk out on here and I start talking, my heart's like bum, 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 bum. So I'm like, well, let's take this adrenaline. Let's use it. And I burn off a little bit of energy that way. And so that works in, in two directions. And I think it's, it, it helps me a lot. If you get massive physical reactions to nervousness, which happens to some people, they get really bad um, sweaty palms, they get really bad dry mouth, they breathe really fast, you can go to your doctor and say, I have super bad stage fright, and they will give you something called beta blockers. And beta blockers work with the receptors in your brain, and they, du they dull slightly your response to fight or flight. They don't sedate you, it doesn't make you slower or dumber, it just lowers your physical response to anxiety. I'm not taking them now. I, I, don't, I don't take them for conference talks. It's not too bad. I get a little bit agitated, but not, not so much to need this. But it's a godsend for some people. So consider that if you really need it. However, if you're not into drugs, there's a natural solution. Or if you are into drugs. <laughs> no judgment. It's Portland. It's cool. <laughs> um, so I saw an amazing TED talk recently by a woman named Amy Cuddy. And it was about this idea that she calls power posing. So she ran an experiment where she had subjects take one of two different kinds of poses. One was high power pose. And a high power pose looks like this, right? Or this. Or sitting down, arms behind the head, feet up on the table. You know, that kind of thing. And then she had ha the other half of her subjects take low power poses. They looked kind of like this. And they were or sort of like, you know, at the table with their, their head down, arms crossed, things like that. And then she took those groups of people and sent them to mock interviews. And then afterwards asked the mock interviewers, who would you rather hire? And the people that had done power poses were hired at a much higher rate than the people that had done low power poses. And basically what she found through brain activity is that when you act like you are confident and you feel good and you're on top of the world, your brain adjusts and believes it. 
if you fake it, it makes it true. It's weird. It's like the same thing where if you force yourself to smile for a while, you start to feel happy. Your brain really does work in that direction. It can take inputs in what feel like outputs. So consider power posing. If you had looked back by the sound booth when you guys were walking in, you would have seen me standing there like this. <laughs> True story. You can ask Cassie, is that right? True story, she says yes. Um, so consider that, it works. So I, I told Chad Fowler about this on our podcast, and um, by the way, we have a podcast. Um, and he, I was supposed to go to Railsbury, my flight got canceled, I couldn't make it, so on my behalf, he asked the Railsbury people to power pose. This is it from the front, this is it from the back. Power posing, it takes two minutes to get the effect in your brain. So give it a try. Next time you have a talk, go in the bathroom, go in the back of the room, take some strong poses, fake it till you make it. You'll feel much better. By the way, um, so uh, one other way of dealing with talk, nerves. Almost every talk has a nodder, which is someone that almost no matter what you say, they're like. <laughs> I haven't spotted this talk's nodder yet, actually. But I try to. And so if you're feeling really nervous, scan for your nodder. And look around. And eventually, there he is. <laughs> and then, when you're feeling not so good, you look at him. And you're like, and that's a great idea, right? <laughs> and he's like. And if all else fails, plant a nodder. If, <laughs> true story. So seriously, if you're really nervous, get your best friend and sit him right here, right where Chris Hunt is sitting. <laughs> and then say, I need you to nod at everything I say. <laughs> I get it, I get it, I understand, you're right. <laughs> this talk is awesome, I'm learning so much. That's what you gotta shoot for, that will help so much. And then if, you, if you're really panicking, you just give your talk to Chris, and everybody else is gone, but you're feeling good and you understand and we're together. He's not nodding, he's like, no. <laughs> I'm not your nodder, buddy. Get your own nodder. So, uh, this, is a tr this is a true story. So one time, uh, MIT students decided to prank their professor which MIT students like to do. And um, what they did was, whenever the professor walked in this direction and was lecturing, they would nod. Like, <laughs> totally. Yeah, we, oh, we get it. And they're all like smiling and nodding. And whenever he tried to turn around and walk this way, they were like. <laughs> and so by the end of the talk, this poor guy is literally <laughs> pinned to the wall. And he gave his lecture from here. Because every time he turned, they're like, no, no, oh, no. <laughs> he probably did this a lot. <laughs> Don't start doing this to me. <laughs> You're not allowed to use my own tactics against me. That would be unfair. OK. A um, little more meta stuff, then I have one more lightning talk and we're gonna put this thing to bed. First thing I wanna tell you about is a couple anti-patterns in talks. These are things I see in the audience, I'm just like, ah, oh, dude, don't do that. The first is not being crazy excited. There's no substitute for being really excited to talk to people. That's the best thing you can do to be interesting. Really care. Don't give talks about things you don't care about. Don't give talks about things you're not really passionate about. You're just gonna bomb. It's gonna come off in your delivery, and it's not gonna be great talk. People can spot that stuff. You probably saw a couple talks this week that suffered from that. Good information, impassionate delivery. It's death. Um, next, anti-pattern. Can you guys see this in the back? Oh, I hate that. Or even worse, I know you guys can't see this. You know I can't see it? <laughs> I know you can't eat this cake. <laughs> but it's super good. I spent a lot of time on this. I get to my talks about a half an hour or an hour early, and I open up the slide that's the hardest to read, and I go to the back of the room, and I make sure people can read it. And I never say, can you read this? Or, I'm sorry you can't read this. I've seen people that should know better mess this up. Designers, people whose job it is to figure out good ways to convey information, will can make beautiful slides with tiny, low contrast type. And I'm like, what? How do you not get this? Huge anti-pattern, drives me crazy. Um, 
The other thing is, this one's so tempting, this is so hard to, to avoid, is pre-apologizing. This happens a lot. This is my first talk, and I'm sort of nervous, so I'm sorry if this comes off as blah, 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 blah. It's so natural. You want to do it. It's so hard to avoid. This is the first time I've given this talk. Um, I was just changing things last night. I didn't get a lot of sleep. I have a little bit of a cold. People love to pre-apologize before their, start, their talk starts. Just don't do it. Don't set expectations low, because you're setting expectations low. Don't set them low so you can you know, sort of step over that low bar. Just go for it. Don't pre-apologize. It's hard to do, but don't do it. Next is how to ask for questions. Worst way to ask for questions. Uh, you guys all get this, right? Cool, all right. <laughs> See that all the time. And the thing is, the, the problem is most speakers think they have to fill every bit of space. If there's any dead sound, you've screwed up. It's a little terrifying to leave open space. The way you ask for questions in the talk is, let's have some questions. And then you wait. And as a speaker, it feels like forever. It's only five seconds. But there are people in the audience that are thinking, oh, do I have a question? Oh, is anybody else gonna ask one? Because I kind of do have one, but I don't want to be impolite. Okay, I guess, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll guess. And it's five seconds. But to you, you're like, oh my god, 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 oh my god. <laughs> Please ask me some questions. So, oh, uh, that was a body language thing, by the way. When I ask for questions and I listen to them, I put my hands behind my back. This is a listening pose. You lean forward slightly and you have your hands behind your back. That's how you solicit information from people. It's like, I'm gonna go ahead and put these things away now. <laughs> because I wanna give you my full attention. I'm just gonna put those to rest and I'm opening myself up to you. It's not closed off, it's still open and it's sort of a slightly like, let's do it. And that, and, and that solicits more questions. So you'll, if, you, if you watch videos of my other talk, you'll see me do that. And let's ask some questions. And then I wait, and then someone talks, and I'll, I'll kind of move forward to them. By the way, that's a good way to deal with questions. So say you get a question that you like. So you're listening to the question, you say, oh, that's a, that's a great question. You move towards the questioner. And that's like, oh, yes, I want to connect with you a little bit more, because you asked me a great question. Let's say you're in a meeting, you get a question you don't like, and you go, hmm, okay, uh, well, I think, and you can kind of back away from the questioner. And it still seems professional, it doesn't seem like you're dissing them exactly. <laughs> But it gives that impression. The room can feel what you're thinking when, you, when someone asks you a question. Ah, oh, mm, okay. Well, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, and you're sort of withdrawing yourself. And what you're saying is, that was a dumb question. <laughs> or not, or you know, that's a bad question. You're a jerk. And the room can tell how you feel about it. Body language. Okay, uh, and so, so that's how you ask for questions. Let's have some questions. It shows the expectation that you're going to have questions. I have. And now, I at one time asked for, in my most recent talk, Ancient City Ruby, I said, let's have some questions. And I waited a really long time, and it didn't happen. And so, I did this. <laughs> Body language. This tells you, I'm not going on until I get some questions. <laughs> You're gonna have to ask me what I had for breakfast, or something. <laughs> but I'm waiting, and it worked. Okay. So here are, two, 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 here are two, two last things at the meta level, then we got our talk, our last lightning talk, and we're done. Uh, two things that I think you should do that I messed up. So I didn't take my own advice. The first thing is, don't ever talk the last day. <laughs> People are tired, they're a little conferenced out, attendance is gonna be a little sparse, they probably drank the night before because that's the party night. Don't talk first on the last day. <laughs> Conference organizers, don't put your new speakers in those slots. Put people that you think can handle it. It's hard, it's an uphill battle. It's not impossible, it's just harder. So I, didn't, I, did not, I saw where my spot was on the schedule and I didn't try to correct it. Almost every organizer, if when you get your acceptance, you say, thanks so much, I can't wait to speak. Um, can you please put me early on in the, in the, in the, the program? Go, it makes, one, makes, makes a huge difference. Plus it makes the conference a little more fun, I think, when you don't have your talk hanging over you. It's a little bit of a bummer. The other thing is, um, don't ever give talks in giant rooms. <laughs> what I wish I had done, and what I often do, is I say, can you please give me your smallest room? Because a, if you have 500 people at your talk in a room that holds 450, it's gonna feel amazing. The energy level is gonna be so high. People are like, wow, they're packed around the back edges. And you can take a really cool picture from the stage, and you look awesome. If you have 500 people in a room that seats 1,000, everyone looks around and goes, oh wow, this guy must suck. Nobody's here. Do you want to go check out the other thing? Because 
It's like the nightclub thing, you know? A half full nightclub, no one wants that. Um, so ask for small rooms. If you're a beginning speaker, beginning of the program, small rooms. A little pressure. This one filled up nicely, but you'll notice when you walked in, I had a sign that said, please come sit up as close as possible. That was not an accident. I didn't want you spread out over this whole room. I wanted to fill up the front first, and then slowly fill back, and that makes it feel more exciting. Feel, look how exciting it is having those guys stand over there. Do you feel the energy coming off them? They're like, we can't even sit down and we want to hear what this guy has to say. <laughs> it's a huge difference. Okay. We're about to try something a little crazy. Are you willing to work with me? You willing to trust me? All right, here we go. Is it, is it anybody's birthday today? I see a hand. What's your name? Jason. Okay, everybody, it's Jason's birthday today. Jason, have you ever had 400 people sing you happy birthday? <laughs> what, you prefer not to? Well, you were in the wrong talk, my friend. <laughs> Everyone, would you please sing Jason happy birthday? Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Jason. Happy birthday. Excellent job. Okay, I'm about to tell you my deep dark secret, which is when I'm not writing Ruby, my side job is that I'm a chorus director. I, direct a, I help direct a 60-man chorus just outside Boston. And what I'm going to do now is draft you all into the RailsConf chorus. You have all passed your audition with that lovely rendition of Happy Birthday. Uh, welcome to the chorus. Would you please turn to your neighbor and say, welcome to the chorus. Nice job passing your audition. Thank you. So here's what I'm, here's what I'm gonna teach you. I'm gonna teach you how to improve happy birthday by a thousand percent over what we just sang. Now the first and most important thing we're gonna do to move the, is to stand up. The next most important thing to do is to realize that if you have an attitude that says, I am not a good singer, you are wrong. You have gotten that programming in your head, it is not true. The problem that is, is true is that no one has ever taught you how to sing correctly, and I'm about to do it right now. It's very easy, anybody can do it. So here are, here's how we're gonna improve happy birthday, a thousand percent. First, we have to pick a starting pitch. So what happened was, everyone sort of started in their own area, wherever they wanted. So the low bassly man said, happy birthday to you. And the baritone said, happy birthday to you. And the woman said, happy birthday to you. And what we got, in the music, is what we call in the music industry, a cluster chord. <laughs> Which is very similar to a not so nice word for how it sounds. Um, so what we need to do is pick a starting pitch. So when we start this next rendition with our 1,000% improved happy birthday, I will start the pitch and we will all sing in the same key and it will sound beautiful. The next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna tell you how to stand. So here's how you stand normally. <laughs> the way you stand when you sing is tall is buoyant. It's not military style, but your chest is lifted, and you feel proud, and you feel proud because you're in the Rails Comp chorus. <laughs> I'm your director, Ben, and I'm gonna be making us sound amazing tonight. Now, so that's how you stand. Here's how you breathe. Take one hand and put it up on your chest, and one hand and put it right around the belly button level. Now, watch my, watch my hands and see which ones move when I breathe. There are no six packs in singing. The bottom hand moves. Take a couple breaths and move your bottom hand, but not your top hand, and see what that feels like. That's a diaphragmatic breath. That's a singer's breath. That's how you breathe when you sing. Think, you can think of it as a low accordion happening down here. You can put your hands down. Let's all take a breath together and let's send it nice and low. Ready? Breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. And this time when you breathe out, add a little vocalization. Go, <sighs> and see how good that feels. Ready? Breathe in and out. Good, do it one more time and let some relaxation come into your body when you do that. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> we never do that. We never do it, but it feels so good. So that's how to stand, tall. That's how to breathe, nice and low. And now I wanna to talk to you about improving resonance. So here's how it sounds if I sing with, well, first of all, a little anatomy lesson. Take your tongue, touch it to the roof of your mouth, and feel that hard thing. Now slide it back until it gets soft. That thing you just hit in the back that's soft is called your soft palate. Now, at the end of a trumpet, you have a bell. And the reason you have a bell is because it makes the trumpet louder. 
So we have our bell, and it's our soft palate. It's the area around our soft palate. So what we want to do as singers is open that area up as much as possible. So here's how it sounds like if I sing when my soft palate is down. I'll sing something like, we write lots of code. And if I instead open it up with my soft palate lifted, it sounds like, we write lots of code. And I think you probably heard a difference right there. And the way to get to that difference, the way to access that soft palate lift is by thinking of yourself as a radio announcer. <laughs> That's the difference between this voice and my normal speaking voice is amount of soft palate lift. I'm adding myself a resonator at the top of that. So would you sing with the low clap soft palate, we write lots of code right there? We write lots of code. Good, now open it up, radio announcer style, try again. We write lots of code. Holy crap, you hear the difference. <laughs> Woo! Oh my goodness. This thing just, that, that got like 2,000% more manly, if nothing else. <laughs> and ladylike, ladies, very nice job. Okay, um, so try, um, uh, who needs client-side JavaScript? Who needs client-side JavaScript? Let's try, Rails is Omakase. Rails is Omakase. Excellent. So, we're going to sing happy birthday to you in that key. And the most important musical thing, so we're going to stand right, we're going to breathe right, we're going to use our radio announcer for the whole song, and we're gonna do an important musical thing, which is the last phrase has to be super loud. Happy birthday to you, da 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 ba da. Happy birthday, dear Jason. Happy birthday. That's when you let the horse out of the barn. <laughs> Imagine you have a beer stein. <laughs> and you're just, that's that last phrase. It's, it's everything you got has to happen in that phrase. Are you ready? Happy birthday. Let's go to RailsConf Chorus. Happy birthday to you.